Um, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this year's Bazac Discover 2021 event. Um, you know, as you know, this is our premier technology and education event, and uh, I'll tell you, it's it sure is exciting to be looking at everyone in real versus virtual. I don't know about you all, but I kind of got tired of looking at those little squares on uh, uh, computer screens. So again, thank you for, for coming. Um, during this year's event, we're excited and honored to have the opportunity to bring in industry-related thought leaders to share their insights into manufacturing topics such as digital manufacturing solutions to enhance productivity, economic and supply chain trends uh, heading into 2022, and then we'll have a job shop, profit shop panel of experts actually here tomorrow. But today's topic is, is one uh, that um, certainly in today's environment with the shortage of skilled labor um, supply chain disruptions and the need for greater productivity, I think, is home. When and how to introduce automation to your shop. I'm honored to be able to introduce this morning's keynote speaker, Mr. Mike Chico, President and CEO of Fanic America Corporation. Mike also serves as a director on the Fanic Corporation's Board of Directors. In addition, uh, he's a board member of the Association for Manufacturing Technology, uh, otherwise known as AMT. A 20-plus year veteran of FANUC, he looks pretty young for that, huh? Um, Mike oversaw departments ranging from material handling to domestic automotive sales prior to becoming FANUC America's uh, corporation's president in 2016. Since receiving his Bachelor of Science degree in electrical engineering in 1998, he's focused his professional career on automation and now leads one of the foremost providers of factory automation solutions in the country. This morning, Mike is going to share his thoughts and insight into what drives the need for automation and when and how to introduce it. At the conclusion of his presentation, uh, we will leave some time for Q&A, so please pay attention, uh, write down your questions, be prepared, and without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike. Thank you, Mike. All right. Uh, my good friend, Dan, thank you very much uh, for the warm introduction, uh, and, and as you mentioned, I'm really happy to see everybody face to face. face. I know we have a good uh, digital audience out there as well, so uh, this is going to get replayed uh, and live forever in the cyberspace uh, coming up. But uh, it's a good topic here, uh, how to automate your shop. Uh, two years ago, the last time uh, Mazak hosted the Discover event, uh, Dan invited me and I gave a similar talk. And to be honest, there's a lot of similar themes uh, from 2019, I guess, I think it was in November when, yeah. uh, when it was last time. Uh, last time we had a snowstorm that we all had to get through to get here that, that time, but this is the weather's a lot better this time. Um, but the fact that there's some similar themes in terms of how to automate your shop, uh, I would say the world is extremely different today than it was two years ago. And so while uh, there's going to be a lot of similar themes that I talk about, I think the reason and the drive to automate is a lot different today uh, than it was two years ago, and it's probably why there's a lot more people uh, here wanting to know about it. So um, uh, as Dan mentioned, I'll take questions uh, at the end, uh, but if something's in your mind that you just want to stop and talk about here, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I've been doing this a long time. I started programming robots uh, a couple years out of college, and that was really my passion uh, before I got into sales and, and management and fanning. So I can, I, can still, uh, I can still talk the talk and walk the walk when it comes to uh, the details. Um, just a couple of talking points I want to get through is what, what does the market look like? I want to show you some interesting data um, from what's called the uh, RIA, which is the Robotics Industry Association, uh, whereas in the metal cutting machine tool world, a lot of our data uh, gets rolled up through the Association of Manufacturing Technology. In the robotics world, uh, it goes through an association called A3, um, and as part of that, there's a group called the uh, RIA, which is the Robotics 
industry association. So I want to show you some interesting data about what's been going on in the robotics market in North America. Uh, we'll talk about some of the influences that are driving automation. It's probably going to be uh, a recap for most of you because you're all seeing it and living it every day. Uh, I want to talk a, a, quite a bit about the skills gap that we face. It's a, it's a big challenge that we have and it's a big passion of mine on how to, how to correct and solve that. And then we'll, we'll dig into some of the details on automation. I hope to dispel some of uh, maybe the uh, misgivings that you might have about how to automate or why to automate or, or maybe some of the fears that are out there. And then we'll look at some of the benefits. Um, there's going to be a continual theme here about collaborative. That's, that's a buzzword in the industry now. Cobot or collaborative robot uh, is something that's been out there. That's probably one of the fastest growing topics uh, that, I've, that I've added since two years ago in this. Um, so let's look at the market. Let's, let's look at the robotics market. And I'm going to pause on this slide for a second. I might move around here um, to show you. So what this shows is this is a quarterly average of how many robots are sold um, in our marketplace year on year for the last couple of years. Um, it says fiscal year at the bottom. That's, that's FANUX fiscal year. Really, um, it's just one quarter shifted back. Uh, but the data trends are pretty much the same. And you can see here that on a quarterly basis back in 2017, which was right around the prior peak of the market, we were averaging somewhere around 8,000 robots every quarter that were consumed in our marketplace. And um, we break down, in, in the robotics market, we break down how robots are consumed in three major buckets. Uh, OEM market, or the, this word OEM is for automotive OEM. So this blue part at the bottom are robots that are sold directly to GM, Ford, Honda, Nissan, Chrysler, those <coughs> companies. And typically the robots in this realm primarily are for spot welding, so they're for welding cars together, but they also include uh, robots that tend to machines that are in powertrain facilities. Uh, they include painting robots and things like that. So these are robots that are sold directly into the automotive OEM market. This middle bucket um, is the automotive components market. The gray, the gray bar in the middle is the automotive components market. And that market um, is, we, it's, it's up to us on how we report the data, very similar to the USMTO data for machine tools. Uh, but typically it's tier ones and tier twos when we categorize a robot that we sold. In this market, there's a lot of arc welding robots. There's a lot of material handling robots uh, that all go into the tier market. And then we lump everything else together up here in this big green area, and this is the general industry market. Um, and within the data, there's, there's a much, much more narrow categories in there in the data that talk about the consumer products market. Um, uh, unfortunately, there isn't a category that says that there is a robot that's on a machine tool. Uh, that, we, that visibility isn't available in the way we categorize the data. Uh, we can tell that the robot is for material handling, and we can tell that it's in a, a market called metals, uh, but it's kind of a broad category. Uh, but, so we're going to make some assumptions a little bit in this category. But the big thing I wanted everyone to see is what's been happening in the marketplace over the last four years. So uh, overall, from an overall robot consumption standpoint, there's been a couple little, uh, uh, just a softening in the market over the last couple years. But for what you've been experiencing in the marketplace and what I typically deal with outside of automotive, we really haven't felt much of a, much of a softening at all because you can see the green part of this chart, except for to the 2019, the green part of this chart has been growing pretty quickly. And in 2021, so far this year, it has been growing very rapidly. Um, the automotive piece of this chart um, if you look back over time since the 80s, is, is kind of an upward trend, but an up and down. It, it really is, the automotive market is, for those of you that are in it, is a very cyclical market um, over time. Uh, and we've been dealing with this. But this green part of the chart has never been this high. And this past quarter um, was the first time that uh, the non-automotive robot orders exceeded the automotive robot orders in the entire industry. Um, and so it, it's a really telling uh, part of our business and what the demand is for robotics today because the automotive piece, it's, it has softened a bit, but it, it's still very strong. It's just that the non-automotive piece is growing more and more. Um, and so 
That's a, that's a really big change in the industry today where non-automotive consumers are buying robots at a record pace and it's throughout the industry and the machine tool market is one of the hottest ones out there. So let's talk about why, why, why. Um, and I really probably won't even get off the first bullet point, which is why I bolded it and made it bigger because I used to, we used to talk about all of these things. When, you know, when I would try to sell companies on why they should automate, we talked a lot, uh, and I'm still gonna touch on some of these things of just, you know, that if, if your labor rate's too high, or if you wanna run a third shift and try to do lights out, or you know, from some, some of the safety aspects, if you, you're running really big parts and things like that. But the overwhelming part of the discussions today is about people and about the labor shortage. And um, uh, I was telling Dan uh, earlier today, last week, I was able to meet with the uh, Secretary of Labor uh, through, a, through a mutual friend. And uh, we talked a lot and we, we talked a lot about there's, there's five million missing workers somewhere that pre-COVID, pre, uh, pre-pandemic, and now as we can't really call it post-pandemic yet, but we're getting close that there's, there's five million missing workers that we can't figure out where they are. And we're trying to break it down into people that retired early, so people in their late 50s, early 60s that had enough with the pandemic and enough with the workforce, and so they called it, or they're not back into the workforce yet. And then there's a spot at the very bottom uh, of young workers that uh, are now still out of the workplace trying to figure out what they, what they, what they really want to do for a living. But this labor shortage is something that's driving automation across the industry. Uh, it, and it's not just happening in America, it's happening in Europe, it's happening in Asia, um, and it's, it's, it's really a global issue. So let's look at a couple of the key issues, uh, a couple of the key numbers here. Um, this is just in demographics of the age of our workforce that uh, in the next five to 10 years, there's, there's millions of people that are gonna be exiting uh, the workplace. Uh, and, and from a retirement standpoint. That, 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 this, these numbers were discussed before the pandemic. Um, we expect there to be um, two and a half million unfilled jobs in the, in the manufacturing uh, industry. And then trying to relate that back to uh, metalworking, uh, there's 23,000 shops out there. And this is our biggest challenge is, uh, and for a number of you in the room, is uh, you're, you're in this category and how do we reach you and how do we talk to you and, and teach you about automation and how, how to get over that hump of the fear of doing it. And I hope to be able to share that with you today. Um, looking at all the, uh, all the machine tools that are out there and then one of the key areas that is always going to be critical for machine tool automation is, uh, is how, how to maximize your spindle utilization. Uh, Mazak's done an incredible job uh, adding features uh, within the machine itself to be able to maximize your spindle utilization within the machine, uh, but putting automation uh, on the front part of the machine is an excellent way to uh, minimize all the different labor challenges that you might have in terms of uh, no-shows on labor or working through lunches and setting up things on a third shift or a second shift to try to maximize that, that spindle utilization. Uh, and then just to highlight this, that uh, this is what, what everyone calls that, that skills gap. Um, uh, I talk to a lot of people out in the industry, and this says, this says manufacturing CEOs. It doesn't really even need to say CEOs. It just could be everybody in manufacturing because I, I talk to people throughout organizations. But um, this, the lack of applicants that, that is out there right now to try to work uh, in the field is a big problem. And then one of the other big challenges is, is that the people that we get don't have the right technical capabilities uh, to be able to either operate the machinery or that there's a fear of whether or not they'd be able to use robotics uh, in general. And so I hope to show you some information uh, that might dispel that or at least give you a pathway to find people that have these technical skills. Um, and so we're in a big shift right now. We have, we have an aging workforce. Uh, we have a younger workforce that, that doesn't know the same things about manufacturing that we learned uh, over our experience. And, and it's, a big, it's a big problem. Uh, and I'm going to touch on it uh, here in a, in a minute. But before I get to that, I just want to just highlight just some of the benefits of automation. So for, the, for those of you that are out there that are, actually maybe it's a question for you. How many people are totally new to robotics that, you've, that you don't have a robot in your shop right now? Do we have a lot of no, no, no robot users? So there's a fair number. How about shop owners that have a robot in some way, shape, or form? Okay, about 50-50, maybe a little bit on the other side. Um, so for those of you that don't have a robot, 
Um, this is going to be a little bit of review for, for those of you that do, but I just want to touch on a couple of the different benefits of why people automate. Uh, consistency being a big one. Um, making sure that when you talk to your end customers that you can say, I can produce this many parts in this amount of time. Uh, that's one of the key areas that robotics brings to you that um, you know at the beginning of the day, as long as you have enough raw material and as long as your tool life is set up right and you know the machine, that you know exactly how many parts you're going to get out of that machine every day. Um, whereas when you uh, have a manual workforce or you have one operator that's trying to operate a bunch of machines, uh, sometimes that output is, is unpredictable. Uh, the next thing is quality. This is one of the um, added benefits that a lot of people forget about when they start getting into robotics is they see the robot as a very simple thing to get a part in a, in a machine and out of a machine. Uh, but while the machine is machining, that robot's just sitting there and you can program it to do a lot of other things besides just, just moving the part in and out of the machine. So doing some in-process gauging, doing some level of inspection, uh, over-utilizing the asset, uh, of, which is the robot, is always a good idea. So almost no matter what you do with robotics, uh, you can program that robot to tend multiple machines, which is another slide I have coming up of, of being able to utilize the asset to tend multiple machines. But if you have a one robot, single robot to single machine, during the machining time, you might as well have that robot do something other than just sit there and wait for the machine to finish, and is a good idea. Um, and that way you can guarantee to your customers that you have 100% part inspection. Um, uh, later this week, I think you're gonna talk a lot about data. There's some other speakers that are gonna talk about Industry 4.0 and some of the data trends. But the, this, these robots now, they're, we're able to track all that data too. So you can, you can take this data, you can dump it into a database, you can put it into an ERP system uh, or an MES system and, and really have a, a good handle on uh, every single part that goes through the system. Uh, this part I said about efficiency. Um, one other way to maximize that asset is to put multiple machines around it. And you can do this in a couple ways. In the picture here, you can see that the robot is surrounded uh, by machines. Uh, but now you can, uh, you can put the robot on a linear track to have the robot physically move and go back and forth. Uh, there are uh, what are called um, mobile robots, where you can put the robot on top of a mobile cart and the, ro the robot itself can drive itself from, from machine to machine. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to do that to try to maximize your, uh, your efficiency on the robot. And in this case, a lot of cells that look like this tend to be pretty high volume cells. If this isn't the traditional job shop uh, cell where you might want to change what you do on this machine, uh, these are typically high, high volume uh, cells that get set up like this because this is a, a fairly permanent solution. Uh, but I recognize that there's a need for a lot of flexibility. Um, I mentioned this earlier just about heavy parts. Uh, robots today are getting more and more capable from a part uh, weight standpoint. Uh, at our headquarters in, in Michigan up in Rochester Hills, uh, and an open invitation if anyone wants to come uh, see a bunch of robots firsthand, uh, at our headquarters or any of our any of our locations. But at our headquarters, we have this robot here. I should have probably added the picture, but uh, this robot is actually picking up a fully uh, produced uh, C8 Corvette uh, in, our, in our place with no problem. Uh, so all we did was is just fab up a, a, a little fork that goes underneath the car, uh, bolted it to the end of the robot, and the robot can move the whole car around. Uh, it really opens up your mind about what automation can do when you recognize that the robot can pick up 5,000 pounds. Um, there's a lot of machines out there. The machines that are out in the industry today that can move that kind of weight around are typically very dedicated or very manual. So it's either some, some level of a, of a, 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 a crane or um, some, some jig or something that's gonna move that part around, or it's a very dedicated, very expensive machine. But as soon as you can get a robot, it's, it's infinitely flexible. Uh, it really opens up your mind on how to handle heavy parts uh, because you can, you can treat it just like a small robot. Uh, it programs exactly the same. There's really no difference except that it's bigger and can handle more weight. So there's great ways to handle safety uh, with the robots. And then this, is, this is kind of a new thing. This, in the last couple of years, um, what we're seeing as a trend 
in the industry is that from a consumer, for, so for, for those of you that are using robotics right now, or for those of you that aren't that are thinking about it, there's a lot of different pathways to go in terms of how you, how you get to that, that, that spot where you're using uh, the automation. Uh, one way is to, to call Mazak and, and have them and their engineers uh, help you out. Another way is to call Fanuc and we can do that. There's integrators, uh, systems integrators that can help you. Um, or you can try to do it on your, on your own. If, you're, if your employees are, are going to be the ones learning how to program the robot, you might just want to do it on your own. And because of that way, um, this, this concept of a pre-engineered system is really starting to take hold and, uh, and be f fairly popular in the marketplace. So, um, oh, I have the actual Mazak one on the next slide, but uh, you can see, you'll see this robot out in, uh, on the floors. This is called, this is our robot called a CRX robot, is a collaborative robot. But this, this idea of a pre-engineered system can be collaborative robots, it can be non-collaborative robots, uh, but typically what it is, is it's something that you buy that includes the robot itself. It probably includes some level of communication to the machine. Um, and so the Mazak machines now have really slick interfaces where you can just plug the robot um, right into the machine and have the communication pre-configured. Uh, but this would be a way where you don't necessarily want to pay someone to come in and do the whole entire installation. You want to have some level of ownership, but maybe you don't have as much mechanical engineering expertise in your shop. So you buy something that is fully set up to have some flexibility, like a little part, part stalker here, or a little turntable here like this one, um, and then you take, you take it from there. You, you buy a, a fully configured system and then you handle the programming and the interface and things like that. And so this is a growing way uh, to do robots and automation in your factory where you can take uh, a pretty significant level of ownership uh, of it. And this also then drives the price down because then you're paying for hardware and not necessarily all the installation costs and things like that uh, that come with it. Uh, so this is, this is a growing trend and you'll see, uh, you'll see a system like this that, that Mazak makes that's out on the floor today too. Um, so let's talk then about systems integrators. Um, as I mentioned, if you're going to get into robots and automation, there's a lot of different ways to head down that path. Um, when I first started into this business in the 90s, there was only really one way. If you wanted a robot, you called the robot company, and the robot company provided you the robot. That, that was really the only way that it was. Um, and throughout the 90s and into the 2000s, uh, the concept of a systems integrator took hold. Um, and it was pretty beneficial to us because it allowed us to get out into industries that we would have never gotten into uh, on our own. That our engineering staff was limited and so if a pharmaceutical company wanted a robot and we didn't have any experts within FANUC that were experts in pharmaceutical, uh, we went and found companies that were experts in that area and we utilized them as integrators. Um, so the concept of, in, in, of systems integrators has really blossomed and now we're evolving now into a next phase of that where you might be wondering whether you need it or not because the, the idea of robots is getting even further and further um, integrated into your shops. And so, it's, I mean, right off the bat, it's really up to you. Um, but some of the pros and cons here is integrators do have the expertise to, to perfectly meet your needs. That, that it's their business to do this, to, to come to your shop to look at what your part mix is, to look at what your spindle utilization is, to, to talk to you about the future, and, and they're the experts in that. They, that's, that's what they do for a living. Um, and uh, they also are very experienced in the safety aspects uh, of robotics as well. They, they cannot be overlooked. Uh, collaborative robots uh, are a thing that are, are safe to use around people, but um, and people always use this, this analogy with, uh, with collaborative robots. A collaborative robot is good and safe and collaborative um, if it's holding a pillow. But if you're machining uh, Leatherman knives on the robot and the robot takes a, a machine knife out of the machine, it's, it's, not, it's not safe anymore. It doesn't matter if the robot's collaborative because it's holding something that could hurt you. And those are some of the aspects about uh, automation where a lot of people think, well, I have a collaborative robot. I don't need a fence. I can do whatever with it. But it's not really, you really do have to pay some risk assessment uh, attention to it. Um, and, then, and the systems integrators are good at that. But there's, there's forms and there's uh, online tools that can help you with that as well. 
Um, uh, the uh, a system integrator could most likely get you the uh, faster than you can get you into production faster because they're dedicated to it. Um, but so these are all some of the pros about using a systems integrator. But in the end, I want to just highlight that it really is your choice, um, and there are ways now to integrate robots uh, on your own without the need for a systems integrator, but you really should weigh the pros and cons. The last thing we want, as automation suppliers, what I do for a living, the last thing we want is someone to invest in a robot and have it sit there and not do anything. That's the, that's the worst thing possible because it, it ruins your next uh, opportunity and your next next opportunity, and that's some of the hardest sales that us and our, and our, our uh, distribution network goes through is, trying to get someone's mindset overcome that had a bad experience with a robot previously. That's one of the hardest sells that we have is to walk into a shop that someone that either failed with a robot or it never quite worked right, or they tried to do it on their own and couldn't get it to work, and then to try to, to get them to do it again. And so we want people to be successful uh, right from the beginning. Uh, this is one way to do it. A pre-engineered cell is another way to do it. Um, uh, working with your machine tool distributor, working with the machine tool OEM like Mazak is another good way to do it. Okay? So let's talk about collaborative for a minute. Um, I talked about this a minute uh, earlier about some of the pros and cons here. So collaborative robots, um, just to, to highlight the word and, and where it comes from, a collaborative robot in, in uh, by definition, is something that has a safety mechanism built into it where the robot will stop if it touches um, a person or an unexpected object. Uh, that can happen in a couple different ways. In this particular robot, this is a, uh, you could call this like a regular uh, robot from FANUC. It, it doesn't have anything special in this part of the robot. All the green stuff, even though it's painted green instead of yellow, all of that thing is, is exactly like the yellow version. Um, so it has the same motors, the same reducers, the same castings, and it works exactly the same. What's different about this robot is down at the bottom here is a special force sensor that monitors what that robot's feeling as it moves around. And so with this robot, you have to tell it how much weight it's holding, and you tell it where to go, and the sensor feels what the bottom, you know, in the bottom, the sensor's feeling what the robot's doing. And if it feels anything different than what is expected, it stops. Um, and that's how this particular robot works. Some of the big benefits um, of these robots, number one, and this is probably the biggest aspect of collaborative, is they're easier to use. There's a level of complexity that gets taken away when it comes to collaborative because you don't necessarily need a fence. Um, a lot of them are coming with very easy ways to program, which you can see out on the floor with some of the demos that are out on the floor of how easy they are to program and change the program. Um, when we say low cost, it's not so much that the robot itself costs different, uh, but it's the amount of uh, extra time and equipment that goes in and around the robot that makes it lower cost. Whereas if you had a non-collaborative uh, robot cell, you might need a full fence, you might need to have um, someone come in and help program it because it's not as easy to program. You invest in this machine, and but with your investment, you never really know what's going to be machine next on that machine. So to dedicate a piece of automation, it's like one robot to one machine. But not knowing what that machine's going to do next week or next month, it's hard to then tie the, that robot to that machine. But with now with collaborative robots and how lightweight and easy they are, you can invest in your machines as you normally would. You can invest in automation, and you can think about it as a portable asset where. You want to have a, this lathe today because it's tooled up and ready to go for this part. You can wheel up the robot. It's pretty simple to teach a couple pick and place points and it's tending that machine. Tomorrow, part changes and you, uh, you need to run something real fast on that machine. You just wheel the robot out of the way. You're running that machine manually for a little bit because that's what the business says and you can, you can move that robot down to another machine and have it do something totally different. That is not a, that's not, even close to being out of the realm of possibility. It happens all day, every day uh, at a lot of the end customers. So uh, that's a very real, and it's actually demoed outside that you can see it. Um, and so it, it, and it also provides an easy entry into robotics. Um, this is a demo, this is showing uh, the system that you'll see outside. Uh, so as I mentioned, you'll see that this robot here is on, there's casters here at the bottom, 
uh, a couple plates to make it stable that then just flip up when you want to move it around. Uh, typically these cells come with a, uh, some sort of part stalker. Uh, this obviously uh, set up with some parts for the lathe. And then uh, typically what you'll see around collaborative robots is a little sensor like this down at the bottom here, this yellow sensor, and that's called an area scanner. And what that does, that sensor just ties directly into the robot. Uh, but what it's pre-programmed to do is, is that if, uh, you're, if no, one's by, no one's close by this, uh, this sensor sense, it shoots out uh, lasers out the bottom of it and senses your feet and your legs. And if no one's standing by the robot, then the robot can go faster uh, and tend the machine like a normal robot would. And then as you get closer to it, uh, it starts to slow down uh, from a safety aspect. And so a lot of the collaborative robots out in the marketplace do this today like this, of having this sensor where the robot can go fast and then uh, slow down as people get closer to it. Uh, but what you'll see when you, when you go out and demo this cell, and I, if you haven't yet, I encourage everyone to go out there, is number one is how lightweight it is. Uh, being able to move this cart around is extremely easy to do. Uh, uh, an easy gripper uh, connection, this is an area where uh, whether it's, it's Mazak uh, or one of these component companies that makes grippers to be able to swap out fingers or grippers to be able to handle all the different parts that you need. Uh, one of the coolest features of this that you'll see is the manual guided teaching. So different than the previous robot I showed you. So the green one that I showed you before, which I said was like a regular robot with a sensor at the bottom, this robot actually has a torque sensor in every joint uh, so it's constructed differently than, than a standard robot, but there's a torque sensor that's in every single joint of this robot. Um, and it gives you the flexibility then, when you put it in manual teaching mode, the robot kind of softens up. And when you grab the arm, um, each torque sensor can feel what you're trying to do, and the robot just relaxes, and then you can just move it around, um, kind of like you do with a ferro arm, like a 3D sensor arm. Um, and you just drag it around and you tell it where you want it to teach. Um, some of the tooling comes with little buttons on it where you can teach points right from the tooling. Otherwise, now there's a, a, a really easy to use tablet where there's not even any buttons anymore. This is just a regular Samsung tablet, uh, which is the teaching device for the robot. And so this area, this manual teaching area, has really broken down a lot of the barriers of where some of the fear of first-time automation came about because in this particular case, you can imagine a first-time user, if they already know how to program the machine, they know how the G-code works, they know what the interface to the machine looks like. But now, if you, can, if you just need to grab the robot and move it over to that first point and say, here's where the first part is that I need you to pick, and the robot takes it from there, and it, it's already programmed to calculate all the other points from there, you just have to teach it one of them, and it figures out the rest, and then you just, you literally take the part and you move it into the, by the chuck and you say here's where to put the part and it takes it from there. Um, it, it turns into a pretty simple thing to do. And we're, this is where we're seeing uh, this particular piece of automation and things just like this uh, are starting to be one of the more popular ways that people are tending machines now. Um, it's very flexible, it's very easy to use, it's very portable, it's very cost effective um, and this robot's really well suited for this. It comes in two sizes right now. This is like, there's a, a long arm version of it and a short arm version. And we're working real hard to create more variants of this with uh, bigger payloads and smaller payloads and stuff like that. So that this type of collaborative robot uh, is tending to be one of the more uh, powerful things in the industry. Okay? So now's the time when you talk to Dan, you start putting in all your orders for machines and your robots and things like that. Everyone ready for that? So, but unfortunately, uh, People are still probably sitting there and saying, well, you know, Mike's a really convincing guy uh, and he, he said a lot of great things, but um, here's all the buts. And this is, I've been doing this a long time. Here's all the buts that we normally hear. I still want to run manual sometimes. And my people, my people just aren't trained. My shop's too small. I can't afford it um, and things like that. But I'm here to tell you, and actually when I put this picture in, I thought it was going to be funny, but it's more creepy than funny. Um, <laughs> I, th I thought, I, 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 I searched for Google and said, you can do it in Google search. And I said, oh, cool, it's like a robot and you can do it at the same time. But now that I'm doing this in real life, uh, that's more creepy than I thought it was going to be. But you can. Um, and I'm just going to highlight a couple different reasons why. So number one, if you think robots can't be connected to machines, uh, that's not true. 
Uh, I know for a fact that Mazak is diligently working on further and further ways to open up more data between the robot and the machine. And uh, I put the logo for MT Connect here, which is already a standard protocol um, that connects robots to machines that Mazak supports, that FANUC supports. Um, hooking up the robot to the machine is not as hard as it sounds. It's easy. Um, and there's a lot of data there that, that can be transferred back and forth. And even if you don't, even if you want to take it in the most easiest way, the robot needs to know when the spindle's running and when the door's open. And the robot needs to tell the machine to close the door and start. And that's about it. And other than that, it can take it from there. Now you can get real deep into it and, and do part offsets based off of gauging and, and you can do a, a lot of different things with it. But as long as you can tell the, ro the machine to start and, and the, the, the door to close, and as long as the robot knows that the door's open and the machine stopped, that's about all you really need to do uh, between the robot and the machine. And, and so it, it is much easier than you, than you might think. Um, so it, it, that, if, you're, if you're worried about that, don't, it's easy. Um, I've talked about this probably enough already, but collaborative and fenceless cells uh, make it easy to run in automatic or manual. The one thing I'll probably further mention on this cell though is if you get to a point where you need a bigger robot because your parts are bigger, I don't want you to think that there isn't a collaborative robot for you to use. Um, because the word collaborative robot doesn't just mean a robot itself is collaborative, you can collaborate uh, with other types of robots too. You just need the right uh, sensors. So in this particular cell, um, you can see, as I showed before, you have these, oh, actually you can't really see them in the picture, but they're kind of built in underneath the cell here. Actually, no, I'm sorry, it's right here. Um, this sensor at the bottom of the robot. So this is a non-collaborative robot uh, tending, a, lay, uh, tending um, a machine with a, another part stalker. And this is a non-collaborative robot, but it works in a collaborative way. So there are, there's no fence, um, it operates uh, on its own, and you can just walk right up into this cell and change things around. Uh, and just like some of the uh, challenges that I mentioned, if you ever wanted to run this machine in manual, you're not taking down big sections of fence to be able to do that because all you have is just a little section here and the whole machine is still open. So you can use regular robots in a collaborative way if you have the right sensors set up on the robot itself to be able to stop it if someone goes into the work cell. Um, if you're sitting back there thinking, all oh, that you know, I have, you know, I have this part or that part, and I've never seen a good way to feed that part into the robot cell, this is another really simple thing, and there's a lot of technology out there to be able to uh, do this easily. Whether it's a simple part stalker for round or square parts, whether you're where you have a conveyor in feed. Um, we have a turntable. There's all sorts of different ways to feed parts into the system, um, and it's really as simple as doing a quick Google search on on a, a ways that has happened. Our YouTube page, I, mean, I think we're up to a, a, I don't know a couple hundred thousand videos that have Fanuc robots in them doing different things, and you can find all sorts of different ways that people feed parts into machines. So if this is a, if you're sitting back thinking that, well, how am I going to feed my parts into the machine? There's a way, there's always a way. And even if you come and you're looking at that and you say none of those work, there's another way of use, using a simple camera to just leave your parts right on the pallet and using a camera to find them and do it. This starts getting a little bit more complicated than the, than the easy teach part of it by implementing a camera into it. Um, but this is, this is not something that is challenging in the industry today. Um, there's no lighting challenges, even part finishes, if you have shiny parts, if you have black parts on a black background, there's the, the sensors that we have today in this part of the business, um, all of those barriers are broken down that, that used to be out there in terms of some of the challenges. So even if you just want to leave your parts on a pallet, big parts, this, this particular thing shows a lot of big parts, but even if they're small parts and you just want to leave them on a pallet, um, that's a good way to do it too. That, that's, that's not a real big barrier. Um, for, for how to do things. And the last thing I want to touch on is back on people. Um, and I think that's, again, maybe why a lot of you walked into this room today is uh, because you can't find people and you thinking about automating because uh, you can't find the people to do it. And I want to help you, uh, I, I certainly want to help you automate your machines because I think it's the future. I think the, the, the skills gap is going to be here for so long that there's going to be a big enough gap that we need to supplement skilled trades 
with automation, and we need to maximize the people that are out in the industry today. And, it's, it, and it is not gonna be one or the other, it's a combination of both. That we might have a machinist that, that is gonna focus on uh, from a plant level, maybe not on a machine to machine level, and maybe you're gonna find someone to program some of the robots so that some of the manual labor that's used to tend the machines is supplemented with the robots. And I'm here to tell you from experience that the best way to find people to support this industry is to partner with education. And when I say that, I don't mean universities per se, I mean all levels of education. Um, and we took this stance, we found, as we continued to sell robots and automation, we found that one of the big upcoming challenges was, is there weren't enough people out there that knew how to program robots. So we'd be going in and trying to sell robots to someone, and it was, everything lined up, I have the need, um, I, I, need I need the robot, but I don't, I don't have anyone that can program it. So we started building up our, our academy, Fanix Own Academy, and we train tons of people, and we have the largest robot training facility in the world uh, up at our headquarters in Auburn Hills, and Rochester Hills, and we do training here in Cincinnati, or my guys here from Cincinnati, we do training um, at 20 of our other regional locations, but it still wasn't enough. We still couldn't train enough people to fill up the industry. And so what we worked on and what we decided to do is, is we started partnering with education. And currently, and this slide's maybe six, six months old, we currently have robots in 1,300 different educational institutions just in North America. Um, and the bulk of these are uh, two-year tech schools. So it's about 50 to 60% of those are two-year tech education schools, and then the remaining 40% is divvied up between high schools and then universities. And this is providing 100,000 people, kids, every year that are looking to get into the workplace that because of what we've provided, they're coming out with not, I'm not talking about learning how to, like a toy robot or like a, like a Lego robot or something like that. They have real robots and they're, they're learning real programming skills. Um, we have examples in downtown Detroit, uh, a big automotive component company called Flexigate was gonna build a new plant down there and they recognized that they didn't have enough people. And the local high school said, guess what? We have a high school that we can't place, you know, a lot of these kids are just going right into the workforce um, after high school and we're having a hard time placing them. And we said, win-win. So we put um, a couple dozen robots down at the high school um, and those robots are teaching the kids, that the kids are learning how to program robots and they're feeding right into the flexing gate plant, making a ton of money coming right out of high school. And so, what I, so I know I'm talking to some of the Mazak distributors, and so I'd, extru, I'd, I'd uh, encourage you to, and we can help you with this, find all these dots, find what school is which one of those dots, depending on where you are. And if you're here owning a shop um, or associated with the shop, uh, we can again do that same thing. So find, find which one of those dots is best suited to help you guys, and go knock on their door and say, listen, I run a local shop, um, and I'm gonna, I, I'd like some of the kids, whether it's let's start an internship, let's start an apprenticeship, or I'll, I'll, hire, the next, I'll hire half of the next graduating class. Um, part of the biggest problem we have now, actually truthfully is, is a lot of the two-year tech schools, the kids are getting recruited to stop school and go work before they finish, and we're saying, no, 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 you should definitely get your associate's degree and finish school um, and then go work. But we're finding employers that wanna supplement it so they can fund some of this. Um, and it, it, so it's, it's, it's an untapped area that I always talk about now because if you don't know what your lo who your local tech school is, um, or if any of the high schools in the area have robots or automation, or CNC technology, this is, this is not just I'm talking about automation now, now I'm talking about all of manufacturing technology. Um, uh, when, I, when, I met, when I met with the Secretary of Labor last week, I told him, one of the most disturbing things, I have, I have four kids. My oldest boy's a, a junior in high school, and I have two uh, twins that are freshmen in high school, and then I have a, a young daughter that's in fifth grade. And I talk to them a lot, they obviously know what I do, and they come into the shop and program robots with me and stuff like that. But when I talk to them about manufacturing, because they've seen the really cool part about manufacturing, they see robots holding cars and, and in the food, you know, hey, do you ever wonder how Doritos are made and stuff like that, and, and see robots in cool spots. But when I talk to them from a school perspective, 
where they learn about manufacturing? They learn about it in history class, learning about uh, Henry Ford and the Model T and the assembly line. And we're not teaching our kids um, about manufacturing. It should be in science class when we're talking about manufacturing. And so that's a big problem, but every dot on this map is, is an area where um, there's gonna be some, somebody in some place that's gonna be educating uh, young people that are gonna, they're, they're gonna help. So uh, if you have existing workers that need to get trained, send them to FANUC. Uh, we have a lot of areas that we, that we can help existing workers. And if, you've, if you need more workers, uh, find a dot on that map and figure out who it is and, and knock on their door and say you wanna help, okay? Um, and then how do I get started? Uh, you're in the right spot. You've got, uh, you've got all the, the best people in the world from Mazak here. Uh, you've got your local distributors here. Uh, like I said, you could, you could go find an integrator. We can help you with that. Um, just pick, pick an application and go. Some of these, one of the best things about these collaborative robots are is, is that we found companies where, um, maybe not in a job shop environment, but in, in just a, uh, a small manufacturing environment where there, there might be an application where you just need to pick something up and move it from here to here. Like there's somebody that's picking something up, looking at it to make sure it got done, something done to it and moving it from here to here. That's a perfect way to start. Just get a collaborative robot, program it to move something from here to here and maybe implement a camera to do the check that the person was doing and then free up that person to go do something better than just moving apart from point A to point B. Um, and so it, the, the, the best, best way to get started is start to talk to somebody that knows what they're doing in it and there's a lot of people around here that, that know that, so um, that's the best way. Okay, and so that's my last one. So now I think Super. it's Q and A time. Okay, we've got um, maybe about uh, five, six minutes for questions. But first, real quick, I, the National Association of Manufacturers, um, their latest. Their, their most recent uh, data, as of the end of September, early October, there are 10.5 million unfilled jobs in the U.S. There are only 8.5 million active individuals looking. Of those 10.5 million, 900,000 are in manufacturing. Not, so we're competing against all other manufacturers, you know, across this country to fill 900,000 jobs because of the imbalance of supply and demand that we see in the market right now. So um, great stuff, really, really good information. Any, uh, any questions for Mike? A lot, of, a lot of note takers. Yes, in the Mr. back Burkle. of the room, Mr. Burkle. Um, any uh, uh, progress or breakthroughs in uh, vision systems, Mike, that have uh, helped enable you with uh, new applications? Yeah, that's a great, uh, great question, Chuck. Uh, the question was, is there any breakthroughs in vision systems? Um, and so what I would say, there's two, two probably big areas that I would highlight with that. Number one is how integrated the vision systems are becoming with the robot today. Um, I don't know if, I don't think it's out on the robot you have on your floor, but on the new, the, the, the CRX robot that we have, when you put a vision camera on that robot, you just plug it into the port, and it pops up on the screen that says, oh, I see a camera got connected. And then you go through a step-by-step -step guide where you just click through a couple screens. And I, unfortunately, I told my applications engineer that we're automating him out of a job right now. He's a very good guy. We're not actually automating him out of a job. But the robots really teach themselves how the vision works today. So that's number one is, is it used to be a pretty complicated uh, calibration set up to get everything kind of hooked together and it's not like that anymore that you you it recognizes that it's on there and it kind of figures itself out and then the second one I, I mentioned one of the challenges is especially in machining is about lighting and shiny stuff and the, the contrast between shiny and dull and the the way the cameras work today and the software that's embedded into the cameras you I mean it's it's it, it isn't magic but it's kind of like magic is is you just say Get rid of get rid of hot spots, and the, the software just takes them right away. Um, and so there's some lighting, there's some software within the cameras today that take a lot of the lighting challenges that used to be uh, a struggle with vision out of it. So those are probably the two biggest things: is how easy it is to connect the camera, and then the lighting. Um, and if you want to get further into the to the weeds on this, the the 3D sensing technology today um, is absolutely incredible for what we have. We have uh, a device, it's, 
it's kind of it's small it's like this big um, it has two cameras and a little projector built into a small device that's this big and it's a 3d sensor and if you ever wondered how um, all the e-commerce companies that I'm not allowed to say their names by name uh, sort packages and are able to pick and place things real fast so that you get your stuff in two days um, it's because of sensors like that so that's probably the third one is is the 3d sensing technology uh, that's out there is great so if you're ever trying to pick things out of a random bin uh, give it a second shot if you, if you weren't able to do it yet just a year ago uh, have us take a look at it because the 3d sensing uh, technology is incredible now along those lines do you see much in the way of um AI integrated in with, with robot technology expanding you know, various applications? Yep, yep. Uh, another good question, uh, Dan. So uh, the question is about AI and how that's integrated. It's a, that's an easy word to use, AI, artificial intelligence. Everyone says that they have some level of AI, uh, but I'll say practically the way we use AI, you can think of it more like self-teaching. So our artificial intelligence is more like, uh, especially on the camera side, is like is more self-teaching so that you might train the robot how to pick up uh, a small cylinder of aluminum and what what the AI does is it, it enables that robot to then recognize all sorts of different sizes of, of that. Um, Just kind of build on itself. And, and build on itself. From, yeah, yep. Yeah. So, or in, in the e-commerce area, you mm -hmm. teach it uh, how what one package looks like and mm -hmm. then it, it self-teaches itself with all the other yeah. ones. So that's how we use that's AI. That's pretty cool. Yep. Yeah. Any, uh, any other questions? All right. All right, sounds well, good. Well, Mike, thanks so much. We appreciate it again. Um, and again, the, uh, uh, I believe tomorrow, Mike's presentation will be available um, on demand. You know, so if there was anything in there that uh, you, know, you wanted to check out again a second time, you know, you'll have access to that. So have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.